We've almost reached the halfway point in the semester. Let's see what we should take away from last week. An agency interpretation of the regulations it promulgates is accorded Seminole Rock Hour Deference. After Kaiser, Seminole Rock Hour Deference does not mean deferring to an unreasonable or post hoc interpretation by the agency. An agency interpretation is not due Seminole Rock Hour Deference if it is an unfair surprise damaging to private reliance interests. Agency action is presumptively subject to judicial review. Agency failure to act is reviewable only if the party seeking review pleads a discrete action the agency failed to take. A review in court will order an agency to perform an action only if it finds that it was one the law requires the agency to take. Alleging a failure to take a discrete action is to be contrasted to a broad programmatic attack, a plea for wholesale improvement, a complaint of general deficiencies in compliance, or a prayer for a general order compelling compliance with a broad statutory mandate. Now we turn to a new topic. We have learned that the APA creates a general presumption in favor of judicial review of agency action. But it is only a presumption. The APA itself defines the situations in which there is preclusion of judicial review. Where judicial review of what happened to be illegal agency action is precluded, the remedy, if any, lies elsewhere than a court. When is judicial review precluded? The idea that courts have authority to review all official actions has deep roots. According to Sir Edward Cook, authority doth belong to the king's bench to correct any manner of misgovernment, so that no wrong or injury, either public or private, can be done, but that the same shall be reformed or punished by due course of law. According to APA section 702, a right of review, a person suffering legal wrong because of agency action or adversely affected or aggrieved is entitled to judicial review thereof. So far, this coincides with the English tradition defended not only by Cook, but by the eminent authority Albert Van Dicey, Vinarian Professor of English Law at Oxford for 27 years. Dicey was adamant that judicial review was the great security of the rule of law. Sec APA section 704 continues the theme. Agency action made reviewable by statute and final agency action for which there is no other adequate remedy in a court or subject to judicial review. The only limit is that the agency action be final. We will soon have a look at what that means. But APA section 701 has a catch. Application, except to the extent that statutes preclude judicial review or agency action is committed to agency discretion by law. Never mind what Cook and Dicey would say. Who decides whether judicial review is precluded? Well, that falls to the courts. And courts are jealous protectors of their traditional powers. The Supreme Court has repeatedly declared that only upon a showing of clear and convincing evidence should access to judicial review be restricted. APA Section 701A defines two types, different types of preclusion. The first is commonly referred to as 
statutory preclusion, and the second as discretionary preclusion. We have to look at some cases to see how they work. We start with statutory preclusion. In Johnson v. Robinson, the plaintiff, a conscientious objector to military conscription, was denied VA benefits on the ground that his civilian alternative service did not count as active duty. He sued the VA, alleging that the denial violated the Fifth Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. On appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, the VA argued that his claim was precluded from judicial review by statute, namely Section 211A of the VA Act. The decisions of the administrator on any question of law or fact under any law administered by the VA providing benefits for veterans shall be final and conclusive, and no other official or any court shall have power or jurisdiction to review any such decision by an action in the nature of mandamus or otherwise. The language seems fairly clear about what Congress wants. The phrase, any question of law or fact, seems pretty broad. The phrase, shall be final and conclusive, sounds, well, final and conclusive itself, and the real punch is in the phrase, no other official or any court shall have power or jurisdiction. Put it all together, no court has jurisdiction over any question of law decided by the VA. Bear in mind that we are talking here about VA decisions that are contrary to law. The language seems to entail that no court can correct them. That can seem a bit tyrannical. And some have disparaged the provision as Henry VIII in America. Not an especially apt analogy, since the king's courts would have jurisdiction. The idea is that the VA Act Section 211A makes the Secretary of Veterans Affairs a virtual tyrant over veterans. Isn't that unfair? Others have likened the VA Act, preclusion and all, to the benevolent reign of King Solomon. The idea is that Congress wanted the funds it budgeted to go to veterans, not to lawyers. Another provision of the VA Act limits the amount a lawyer can receive as a fee for representing a VA claimant to $10. That used to be real money. But the overall thought motivating Congress was that the VA itself was to be the veteran's advocate and protector. But in Johnson v. Robinson, what the claimant complains of is not so much his treatment by the VA as by Congress. The VA, in denying him benefits, was simply following the active duty requirement Congress imposed as the VA interpreted it. His is an equal protection claim. By cutting COs out of eligibility, Congress and the VA violate his Fifth Amendment right. Is that claim precluded? The court looks at another phrase in the statute. Under any law. The court holds that the question of law raised by the plaintiff is not one pertaining to a decision under the law, but to a question about the constitutionality of that law. Were Section 211A read to preclude judicial review of that kind of question of law, the court would be faced with a serious constitutional question. That is, the serious constitutional question whether Congress has the power to preclude judicial review of the constitutionality of federal statutes or other laws. The constitutional question whether the active duty requirement violates the Equal Protection Clause almost pales by comparison to the serious constitutional question of whether the legislative branch can disable the judicial branch when it comes to the constitutionality of laws. That is not an issue of individual right, but an issue of the separation of powers. What does the Constitution itself say? Article 3, Section 1 vests the judicial power in a Supreme Court. So there it is. Congress may ordain and establish lower courts, but the judicial power is vested in courts. Article 3, Section 2 goes on to specify 
the nature of this judicial power. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and to controversies to which the United States shall be a party. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other, other public ministers and consuls, and those in which the sta a state shall be the, a party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction, both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. This section divides the Supreme Court's jurisdiction into two parts. One is the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction, which does not extend to disputes between the United States and its citizens. The other part is the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction, which does extend, but then there's that bit about exceptions. It's called the Exceptions Clause. Does the Exceptions Clause give Congress the power to preclude judicial review of constitutional questions? Well, that is a constitutional question itself, and the court will read statutes whenever possible to avoid having to confront serious constitutional questions. So the court reads Section 211A of the VA Act as not purporting to preclude a question about the constitutionality of the active duty requirement. So by avoiding the serious constitutional question, the court has to face the less serious one, which it decided in the VA's favor. The plaintiff won the statutory preclusion battle, but lost the active duty war.